comes a rain With my anger comes a tide Of emotion killing joy Cutting steel across your eyes Are you dead? Hi, this is Brendan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Jeremy Bai for another episode of the Ruthless Blood Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about a number of different things related to Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, our Dark Wuxia RPG. We'll be answering some questions. We're going to be talking about play style, jamming style issues, and we might get into a kludge that I've been developing for uh, my own campaign between uh, Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, and another system. But before we get into that, I want to give Jeremy the floor to talk about his upcoming book. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you tell people about uh, the book you have coming out? Sure. I have an original novel coming out. It's actually the first uh, book in a series that's going to be coming out a uh, relatively fast release rate over the next couple months. And the first book is coming out on March 1st. So that's basically a month from now, depending on when the, this podcast actually gets released. And the title of the book is called uh, It's The Heretic Peacekeeper. You can find it basically anywhere online for the most part that you can get uh, books, whether they're Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, or whatever. And it's not a wuxia story. It is actually a combination of cultivation, Xianxia style cultivation story with cyberpunk. So it takes place in like a dark future where there's, you know, of course, a, a, an evil government that controls the world for all, you know, basically... And then the main character is a, is a detective who gets pulled into the cultivation world. And I think it's a, a fresh take on the genre that a lot of people love. A little bit more grounded in reality and character driven. Uh, it's currently up for pre-order pretty much everywhere. So go ahead and do a search for The Heretic Peacekeeper. And um, all right, so getting into the questions. Uh, somebody had asked, I think you, you had mentioned this. Somebody asked if the game was in stock. I guess they had trouble when they were trying to find it on the Osprey website. Uh, and we looked into that, and as far as we can tell, the game is in stock. It says it's in stock at, in the UK and the US on Osprey. It's a, it's in stock on Amazon, where you might run into some issues if you go to Drive Through RPG and you find the PDF. You are not going to find the print version there because it isn't printed through Lightning Source through OBS. So you do have to go to the Osprey's website. We are going to double check with Osprey just to make sure, but as far as we know, it's 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 a uh, it's it's in stock and it's available. Um, so, uh, so getting to the first real question about the game, uh, somebody asked, why aren't there martial nicknames in the book? Um, you know, like in a lot, like it's customary in books like this to often have naming guides and, you know, like I had that in Wandering Here's of Vulgar Gate and, uh, uh, to have, you know, example of, uh, nicknames. One of the issues was, uh, we didn't have the space. We, we had, by the time we got to the end of this, we were already at a point where we had to take out a complete adventure and we just didn't have space for those kinds of things. But Jeremy did put a naming guide up on the Osprey website. It's a really good naming guide, but Jeremy, it doesn't include martial nicknames. Is that correct? It doesn't. It has some Taoist names and Dharma names. So for the Taoist and Buddhist, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go into the whole uh, nickname thing. And so, uh, so what I what we would both recommend is the Tournament of Dalu book that Jeremy and I put out together has a table at the in the appendix appendices uh, that is a complete martial nickname table. It's like two D one hundred tables, and it helps you put together a unique martial nickname. It was based off of something Jeremy had up at Wusha World and then on his own website, and then I basically took that and turned it into a table. And I've found it really useful. I use it all the time in my campaigns. The The Tournament of Dalu book is pay what you want, so you can get it for free. But what I'll probably end up doing is I think I'm going to put it up on the blog. So that, that way it's available to people who, you know, and they can connect it to, to Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades. Technically, we did it for Ogre Gate, but it's martial nicknames. So I don't think there's anything exceptional about Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades that would prevent people from using that. Unless, you know, they're, I mean, the names are all fairly typical of the genre i think right so yeah plus uh, also along with that i wrote a, I, I mean it's been years now i guess since i actually read it but i wrote a little section for the book like a i think it was a couple paragraphs but maybe it was longer it was longer kind of going, it, was it was longer, longer yeah okay. <laughs> going into some details 
So that might be good to, to post up as well. Um, maybe I can mirror that on my blog as well because I think there's some good information. I mean, we didn't have room to put in every single last thing that mm -hmm. could possibly exist in Wuxia in this game. And I think that the, the nickname aspect is one of the ones that if you watch like almost any Wuxia movie, you're going to see that and it's yeah. kind of going to resonate with you as a fan regardless of how much you've seen and uh you know the the key movies that tend to bring people in whether it's crouch tiger hidden dragon um on the more modern end i think or whether it's the shaw brothers stuff they all have characters with those nicknames yeah. and so like, in my opinion it's not one of those things where uh you need a deeper understanding of the genre or the culture to get and I think we were. I think the information we provided on a lot of different subjects was a little bit deeper, and so I feel like most people are going to survive without information yeah. about that. And you can also just, you know, you can Google, um, uh, you can do a Google search and find yeah. generators for these kind of things if you can't I, come come up with your own ideas. I do want to mention that because one of the things that when when we sat down to do this book, it was kind. There was there was sort of like a a dramatic shift occurring in in gaming in nerd culture and everything where online google searches were just becoming way faster than publishing itself and so we we from the very beginning we were like well what are things that in this book we don't necessarily even need to get into because people can google them and if we write something about it it's already going to be out of date by the time the book comes out and i think Marshall nicknames never go out of date, but I think that was something that we sort of thought of as being in that category. Now, you know, that said, uh, again, you, you know, you can go to the Tournament of Dalu thing and get that. You can look at the NPCs in the book because there's quite a number of NPCs and most of them, I think, have Marshall nicknames, right? Like at least a substantial number of them do. And those can serve as examples. Um, one thing I would say is if when you get into martial nicknames, something that's important to consider is where the nickname is coming from. Is it something that the player chooses when they make their character? Or is it something that is said about them and becomes sort of uh, a moniker that the martial world itself imposes on them? Do you know I mean? Because I think those are two different things. So one thing that I, that, that I do when I run these kind of games is, number one, I'll always allow people to to call themselves whatever they want to be called. But I also have a tendency to force them to earn that title. If Especially, like I had a character who, I think his name was Bonebreaker. I think you were in the campaign, if you remember that. And I think early on, it was such a lofty, intimidating name that when the if the character failed to back up the name with any kind of substantial demonstration of power, people would often mock him by calling him so, like a, a softer version of, of the name or, or, or assigning him another uh, type of martial nickname. So I, I, I think one thing to consider about these kind of names in actual play is that they can be something organic that changes over time and reflects what's going on with the character. And they can be something that you have this moment in the campaign where it becomes clear, oh, this is what this person should be called. And then they kind of are called that. And that can come from the player's side. It can come from the GM side. It can come from other players. Um, and like Jeremy was saying, pretty much every Wuxia movie out there you see is going to have characters with nicknames like this, going all the way back to like, you know, Golden Swallow and um, Come Drink With Me. You know, like you, 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 you just, you know, look at what's in the movies and, and, and draw on that, I think. Um, and so, it's one thing that I touch on in that little article that I wrote um, for a Tournament of Dalu that probably bears mentioning and I, I now that you mentioned it, i think it's a it would be good to kind of repost that more publicly so that people can find it is that the way that nicknames are translated into the movies which i think is the most common way that people pick up on this sort of topic is wildly um it varies wildly from movie to movie and from translator to translator whoever translated the movie and there is there is a sort of a convention to the way that it usually works in the novels, but you don't necessarily need to emulate that in your campaigns, at least in my opinion. You know, there's a lot of um, talk nowadays about, you know, things relating to culture and accuracy and whatever. And we tried to be really, really accurate in how we presented just about everything in the book. But this is one of those areas where if you try to stick too much to the accuracy of how it works in real life Usha, and by real life Usha, I mean like, in the uh, original language, Chinese, 
it's going to be difficult and in fact most likely impossible unless you read chinese uh i think a good example is in crouching tiger hidden dragon i think i mentioned this in that article where there's one scene in particular where all these like um jiang who you know tough guys kind of confront and it results in a spectacular fight scene but they're introducing themselves and the way that they introduce themselves in in the subtitles is basically like way different than how they actually introduce themselves in chinese okay. in chinese they're going to have a um you know a fairly long it could be up to four characters long uh nickname and then they add their own name to the end of it usually so that it literally it would be like i am the flying tiger blade you know i'm the flying red tiger blade and then their name Zhang, you know luohan or something like that and then in the subtitles, it'll translate it as like flying tiger or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. And then, and this kind of stuff happens all the time. And so, anyway, my point in all of this is that I don't think you need to worry too much about, oh, is this going to be accurate? If, is my nickname going to translate well into Chinese? Well, actually, in the book, I, for my own sake, translated all of the character names and all of their nicknames into Chinese. Some of them I actually did it the other way around. Like for the characters that I made, a lot of them I generated their name in my mind in Chinese and their nickname. Then I translated it into English. And then other ones, the ones specifically, especially the ones you made, you just kind of made them up. And then what I did was I translated them into Chinese. And incidentally, I am a native English speaker, so I would never take it upon myself to translate from English to Chinese uh, and be confident, completely confident yeah. in that because Chinese is not my native language. So I have my wife help because she's a, a native Chinese speaker. Uh, so between the two of us, we generated uh, a list of all of the character names, the NPCs, and all of their martial nicknames because I wanted to make sure that they all would work uh, in both directions. I didn't want to have a, a character with a nickname uh, in English that didn't make sense if we try to translate it roughly into Chinese. Now, I, yeah. I have to explain, though, that not every nickname translates directly because sometimes you just literally can't do that like there, we have specifically one that jumps out is the dead eunuch um we tried a bunch of different combinations of different characters and words for death with the different characters for eunuch uh and in the end we it hit if i remember i was i was uh, leafing through the book trying to find it off the you know right now and i couldn't find it because he's he's not in the character section i think he's in in uh, an earlier section of of the um rules but in any case his name translates more something like uh, the zombie eunuch, yeah. just because you, it didn't which, really work any other. Which way. you see a lot in Wuxi. You see a lot of zombie named char- zombie factors into names of sex and names of characters a lot of times. But yeah. I feel like I feel like in more recent movies they don't do it. Maybe because of the connotation of zombie. I don't know. I feel like I see it more in like seventies Shaw Brothers movies all the time, but not in recent ones yeah. um could be just just what was popular at the time i don't really know but anyway to end my little rant on the nicknames the the point is just have have fun with it and and i think we even mentioned uh oh no this was in the tournament of dalu actually we mentioned how a lot of times wordplay will come into this uh in terms of like a person will get a nickname because of some aspect of their personality or their martial technique or their history and it'll kind of have a play on words into yeah. their nickname and the thing is if you try to correlate perfectly with chinese in that regard it's going to be very difficult because chinese wordplay is notoriously difficult to translate and then come across with the same feeling so i personally uh, am perfectly fine with using english wordplay yeah. i think the example we used in that was uh somebody who always cuts corners and so then using something along the lines of he's like the corner cutting sword. I can't remember what it was specifically. I think it was, it, was it sounded, those, yeah, it was more, it was more refined than that, but, I, but it, it was, was more refined. Yeah. It sounded really funny and cool. Yeah. So the point is like that kind of stuff is fine. Like use English wordplay. If you try to translate English wordplay into Chinese, it's not going to make any more sense most of the time than Chinese wordplay translated into English. Yeah. So in the spirit of the genre and the language and the culture, I think that having that wordplay and that interesting factor and that, it, it should make sense to the people who are hearing it. And so if you're playing the game in English and your players are English speakers, it should make sense to those uh, speakers, the nicknames and what they mean and their implication. And so the, uh, the next question is, uh, what kind of adventure or scenario design would you suggest for the game? And I think this is a complicated question because 
we designed the game broadly. Like, we didn't really want to lock in. This is meant for this one style of adventure design. Um, and I think the reason for that is, I mean, you know, there's... I, I've never felt like Wuxia demands one style of adventure design. I feel like most people who like Wuxia and are role players have a very clear idea of what they think a Wuxia adventure should be. But but I I, I suspect if I take like the, the 10 most fanatical Wuxia RPG fans and put them in a room, they're all going to have 10 different ideas about what and what sort of adventure structures are most fitting for for wuxia and also i feel like when you watch wuxia as a genre it kind of dips its toes in and out of different adventure structures if you're if you're thinking of the movie in terms of that at the same time it's it's very hard to you know like i think one thing that sometimes happens with wuxia is people are very insistent that wuxia adventures should resemble wuxia movies or stories but we don't do that with any other genre, right? Like we don't, we don't like, like sometimes we will, sometimes we'll say this is a highly genre emulative game and it feels like it's ripped out of the pages of a, you know, Isaac Asimov story or whatever the genre is. Right. But we don't typically impose that on like, say, if you're running a fantasy campaign that it has to have the structure and flow of uh, a Conan story or the Lord of the Rings. It can, you know, so uh, our thinking was any number of adventure structures should be viable in the system, and the system shouldn't thwart that. You know, uh, you know. All that said, I think we both had our preferences in terms of what sort of adventures we like to run with the game. So I don't know. Maybe if you wanted to comment on anything I said or weigh in differently, or if you just want to give what your thinking is on it well i'll give my thinking and and then we can get into our recommendations and i I mean i basically agree with you it's it's um you know there are some games i mean especially nowadays i feel like the with the resurgence in the popularity of tabletop role-playing games combined with also what's happening in pop culture there's there are certain games that come come out that are basically supposed supposed to be like certain movies like the the kids on bikes games and or like the alien role-playing game that yeah. that's pretty hot topic right now i mean it's obviously designed to emulate alien type movies but wuxia is like if you go to my website which i guess i probably should have plugged my website before jeremyby.com i have a recommendations page and on that page i rec i have lit links to all of the movies that we recommend in the book and then also some personal recommendations and incidentally, it's not an exhaustive list. Like there are movies that I did not put on that list because I don't necessarily really like them very much, or I don't think that they should be on a recommendation list for. Well, basically, because I don't really like them. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. Point is, there are a t- like a lot of movies there. Like we have, I think something like sixty just in the book. So if you add in my personal ones, I think it's something like a hundred movies. And if and there's, I mean, just think about that. It's not as though you can get a hundred movies in a genre and they're all going to be the same. Obviously, they're not. Uh, there's a huge variety in the types of movies and stories that come in Wuxia. Like, for example, I'm going to switch to novels here, but the same principle applies in movies. Maybe you can think of some specific examples, Brandon. I'm not sure, but just going with Gulong, who was a big inspiration for this game. You have Lu Xiaofeng. And that's a whole series of stories where Lu Xiaofeng is basically Sherlock Holmes. He's the Wuxia Sherlock Holmes. And his stories tend to be these, you know, mysteries where he's going around so, getting clues and stuff. I will say he's a really eccentric and, uh, I don't know, hedonistic Sherlock Holmes. Well, Sherlock yeah, Holmes was a not, hedonist not, too. Yeah, but. when I say Sherlock Holmes, I mean the genius detective kind of character. Yeah. Um, he's definitely not personality-wise. I, I, I just wanted to prepare people for the... The kinds of things that they'll be encountering with that character. Right. Yeah. Fair <laughs> point. Uh, let me rephrase that. He is. He is. He's the Wuxia of Sherlock Holmes, but with not in terms of his personality. <laughs> uh, anyway, the point is that his novels tend, to, or his stories, the, the Lu Xiaofeng stories, are, you know, like that. He's going around. They're finding clues. He's observing things. He's like uncovering mysteries and then putting all the pieces together. And of course, there's fighting and whatnot. Right. But that's very different from, for instance. Um, the novel I translated, Seven Killers, which is basically a heist story. The, the twist is that the initial heist is supposed to have three experts 
that are good at three different things who are going to go in to uh, steal something that is guarded by seven killers, which is the source of the, of the title. And then the twist is that uh, the main character comes along, and this is spoilers from the first chapter, so if you, if you haven't read it and you want to skip the next ten seconds. Basically, the main character kills those guys and takes over, and he uh, has all of the skills and abilities. So he is a one-man heist team. The point is that story is a heist story, and there are every, all different kinds in the novels and in the movies. So uh, like you were saying, I don't think there is. you could even begin to start to say, oh, well, this is best suited for uh, Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, is best suited for an XYZ style adventure. Like we, you know, you go to page, I think it's roughly page 90 something, is it? I forget, where we list um, uh, suggested, uh, oh no, it's on page 140, adventures and campaigns. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different uh, categories that we suggest that you could have a, an adventure or campaign with a different style, whether it's a heist, whether it's uh, assassination, whether it's a foreign invasion or something. So uh, th in the end, I don't think there's any answer to that question other yeah. than it depends on what you like and what, you're, what you cater to as a GM and what your group likes and what yeah. your group wants and, to, to play. And we should say we don't really even get into structures with those too much. Like some of them necessitate some discussion of structure, but we don't, we don't say to people like you got to structure it around events or you got to structure it around scenes or you have to have a sandbox or you have to have... You know, the, the, I don't care what people do at their table. I, my, my, my feeling is people are going to all run this differently. So, you know, if you're, you know, run it. A, I, 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 I think both of us wanted to make a game that would appeal to a wide audience and wasn't just niche for, you know, because I've done niche and, you know, I like doing niche, but I wanted something that was a little broader this time. I think Jeremy was on the same page with me there. Um, and also, you know, our, our own styles are so divergent that we've, we, we almost out of necessity we couldn't we couldn't just do it one particular way so um yeah i'm sorry were you, were you, were no, you that was pretty much it i was just gonna say that in terms of what i am drawn to personally um i mean i like a little bit of everything to be honest if but if i'm going to sit down and i'm going to plan out what i want to happen i personally like the more intrigue mystery role-playing type stuff as opposed to um, maybe dungeon crawling, hack and slash, just, you know, I, I like the, I think one of my favorite, uh, most, let, let's not say favorite, let's say most memorable, um, of the, let's say the two most memorable and fun experiences I had that come to mind, one would be a really long time ago with Star Wars D20, where I was the, the, the a GM, and my player's, were involved in a man. This is something like 15 years ago, so the details are already kind of fuzzy. But they were basically um, involved in an intrigue plot of assassination between a camp of Wookies and a camp of I'm pretty sure it was humans um, on I forget what planet it was. And there wasn't really a lot of fighting and blasting and lightsabers. It was like a lot of going back and forth and talking and stuff. But it just was really really fun. Another one was playing with you as the uh, the little bi character um, who was kind of role playing that was really really fun and he did do a lot of fighting, but what was what stuck out more to me were the the storytelling elements. So for me personally, I like adventures that while they do have good fight scenes and whatnot, they end up having a lot more of the character interactions, uncovering secrets and mysteries and and those kind of things. And uh, and yeah, and and I tend to I mean. I tend to run things a little bit on the sandboxy side, but sandboxy in the character-driven sense with a with quite a bit of drama thrown in, which I think is... Uh, whenever I say sandbox, I feel like people don't hear that I'm also saying drama at the other half of it, um, which kind of makes my style somewhat of an outlier. Uh, but, but the way that I mostly ran Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades was I sort of dropped the players into this Jiang Hu and see where the... See, paid attention to where they went saw what grudges formed and then eventually something would emerge organically out of that some sort of focus so you know one of the campaigns i think the players ended up joining the cult of the parrot god but if i recall and it's it's been a while so i don't remember precisely i think they joined it but then they turned against it and started working with another organization and so it became this sort of sect intrigue type campaign um 
you know, but, but it really, it really kind of, to me, boils down to, I like seeing where the players want to go is sort of my approach, um, which isn't suitable for everybody. Cause one downside of that is you can get some meandering, you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily go in a clear direction. So, um, you know, but I also like having reliable standby structures that I know I can use. Do you know what I mean? It's like saying, okay, this is a, here's a mission I can throw it. If the players are doing nothing, I can, I can present them with a mission or present them with some option that's clear. Do you know what I mean? So I do like having these other structures available. Um, so yeah, so I mean, you know, run it how you want, run it, run it how you want is my advice and use what structures you're comfortable using uh, because you can do it one of two ways. You can, you can say, okay, uh, I like the movie Golden Swallow, so I'm going to try to turn that into an adventure. And anybody who's ever seen Golden Swallow, I challenge you to turn that into an adventure and see if you can, because it's really tough. I try, I, I tried doing it from eight different angles, and it's very difficult. Um, but speaking you, of, you, hmm. oh, I was going to say you can do that, or you can say I'm going to take all of the elements of Golden Swallow and put them into these time-tested role-playing structures, these role-playing adventure structures, and have it you know, have it work that way. There's di different ways you can approach it. Uh, but what were you going to say? I was just going to say, speaking of that subject, I, right before uh, jumping onto this podcast, I released part two of my top 10 uh, Wuxia movies that can be turned into one shots. Um, and of course, obviously it's my personal opinion, but I picked 10 that I felt you could basically watch the movie and then like take notes and then turn and then basically you know take 20 30 minutes or an hour however long you personally need to turn that into an adventure that could take a, se a single session or you know flesh it out a little bit to turn into a, a series of adventures or even a campaign there are some movies that like you were mentioning don't lend themselves well to that um, another one i which we have we have discussed a lot is bride with white hair um it's just such a cool movie that so many people love and like, but if you tried to recreate that for your players, the, it, you couldn't recreate the movie. There are some movies which you basically can could yeah. almost recreate beat for beat. Um, I'm not going to reveal what the number one on my list is. I bet you you could guess, Brendan. If if you I bet you if you were if you guessed three movies that could be easily translated almost shot for shot or at least scene for scene. I bet you could guess. I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you do it. But no, I'll try to guess. The, come okay. drink with. Come drink with me. Is it come drink with me? No. Is it? Uh, is it Dragon Inn? That's no. That's a good one. No. Um, that was on my previous list. It was on the the number seven um, or something like that. Okay. Uh, it's see. a cult favorite. So. It's a cult favorite. Can I ask? Can I ask one question and get one okay. answer just to narrow it down? Is it a '70s or a '90s movie? Is it, could you put it into one of those categories? '70s. Okay, and it's a cult favorite. Five Deadly Venoms. Oh, that you're you're close but no cigar. Do you want me to tell you, or do you want to um, find out later? Uh, is it the kid with the golden arm? Yes. Bingo. Okay. All right. That was the one I put as number one. Obviously, you know it's very subjective, and you could every. I'm sure every person could pick their own number one, but I feel like you could take the intro and basically every single, almost every single yeah. scene, not literally every single scene, but all the main like stops along the way the plot twists and stuff and you could turn that into um a, a pretty easy one shot of course i think one of the reasons is because the whole escort mission or bodyguard mission is a lot more or it can be a lot more linear and not yeah. feel railroady because you're going from point a to point b um i kind of forgot that, where i was going with no that. no that's a good point escort jobs because the magnificent bodyguards is the same way any 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 uh, adventure that's uh, about an escort company doing something like that ha t fits well into a linear or an adventure path style adventure, right? So I think I, I get exactly what you're saying, which is kind of what I meant when I was saying I like having these existing RPG structures that you can sometimes key to what's going on. Um, uh, I do want to weigh in on Bride with White Hair. I think Bride it. with White Hair makes a really good setting. It makes yeah. a really good setting. It doesn't make a good adventure on its own because the story is focused on these two characters. And unless, like, you're, it, we did a lot of this in the '90s where they would try to kind of emulate a, the drama of a movie like that in a traditional RPG structure, and it gets really murky unless you have special rules for it because 
like are the players just sitting there watching all of this drama unfold are they are they these characters themselves kind of being corralled into these different dramatic moments like it's it's difficult but it, but as a backdrop even as like a campaign like you know if you have an if you have a backdrop for a campaign and you say these are the things that are going to happen over the year unless the players interfere in some way then it could, it could work in that way but you need to have other things that the players are doing that are really the focus more than that you know the story that goes on in Bride with White Hair I think we've both commented though that Bride with White Hair 2 is a really good uh yeah video. I have also have that on my list which as I mentioned in the, the the blog post I really don't like that movie <laughs> but you could go in and watch it and copy it oh I, and I get go ahead I was gonna say I do what the what that movie is is that's like a popcorn wuxia film right like it's 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 got a lot of the I feel like that's the kind of movie number one you kind of have to be a to, to even like that movie, you kind of already have to be a fan of the genre, right? Because I think people that don't like the genre, if they watch that movie, they're just going to be like, what the hell is going on? There's a, a cult of women that hate men and all these, you know, it's got, it's, it's like really heavy handed tropes in it. Um, but it, it's, I would file it as it's kind of a guilty pleasure type Wusha film. It's definitely not as good as the first movie. I think that's without question, but it, it works well as an adventure for sure. Um, I think, I think one of the okay we're gonna get I don't want to get too derailed but I think one of the reasons why I maybe one of the reasons why I disliked it so much was I didn't have any idea what I was getting into going into it mm. and the cover the 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 poster or the cover or whatever shows the two main characters from the first movie but they're basically not in it and yeah. although they do kind of like wrap up their storyline it feels more like uh, oh the movie's over here's what happens what? to them and the movie is just told it's like in terms of virtually everything it's it's different it would, i mean it would be like you go and watch born identity and you're like this is so amazing and then you yeah. go to watch born identity 2 and it's like lethal weapon or something and yeah. you're like what is lethal weapon's on? not a bad movie though i like lethal weapon well that's yeah that's my point is like it's good but if you're going into lethal yeah, weapon with yeah. no idea and you think it's going to be born identity you're going to be like what that's is going that's on? a really good comparison because it is that kind of jump you go from this really romantic tragic story and bright with white hair is romantic and tragic too but the bulk of it is around this ragtag group of yeah. of young heroes who are existing in the aftermath of part one, and it's kind it, it's it's kind of a weird movie. It does a lot of weird things, and so it's just the tone is totally different. Um, yeah. But yeah. So so anyways, again, we'll we'll probably talk more about adventure design on the blog and on, and on the website. I'm going to talk a little bit about if we have time. I'm going to talk about. Uh, getting more dramatic stuff in when we get to the end of the podcast. But before that, we should address the next question, which was, um, uh, you know, what happens when you find out uh, what you're up against? And it turns out it's a guy who's a terrible match against your style and might well annihilate you because of this. So what do you do? Avoid using your strongest skill, etc. You know, I, um, and, and I think one of the things that we were talking about before this is, we were a little unclear whether that's GM perspective or player's perspective, so we're going to try to address it in both ways. Um, I know that Jeremy has a whole thing on his uh, website about the, uh, you know, handling handling this issue. Um, th this is an area where I think, number one, I, I feel like we didn't really want to tell people exactly how to address this. There's there We give a few different remedies for the issue, but we were, I, I feel like, but we, I, at least I didn't want to be prescriptive here. I felt like how you balance your game is kind of your business, right? Like that's sort of like that boils down to play style. And one thing that we can say about the game is it's designed to have power disparity and power spikes because that's inherent in the genre. And, uh, there are different ways with contending with that. And there are different ways of, kind of leaning into that and just allowing it to exist. And so why don't you talk about some of your solutions and I can talk about some of mine. I think there's a couple of different factors that play into it. And one of the biggest ones is whether the question is coming from the player perspective or the GM perspective. Mm. Um, and so on the player side, I think that if you are a player and you you're in the, let's say you're in the talking and analysis phase and you do, um, you know, you, you, you analyze them and you find out, 
their counter and you find out that their counter is basically the perfect counter to your signature ability and it could significantly hurt you. Well, I mean, what's your character going to do in that moment? Is Are you the kind of character who's like, ah, screw it, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to hope that I hit him first and I'm going to hope that I beat him before, you know, hope, I'm going to hope their counter doesn't work. Or are you the kind of character who is going to be like, oh my God, I can't fight this guy and then you try to talk your way out of the fight. I mean... Yeah. It's really just, uh, I think that it, you should fall on role-playing and your character to decide. And, there, and then as for, let's say you go the second route and you somehow manage to talk your way out of the fight, um, you know, who is this enemy to you? Is it yeah. just a guard that you need to bypass or is it your arch rival? Um, do you set up a duel and say, oh, uh, I, you know, I was, I'm hung over, I can't fight, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's fight tomorrow and then you run away? Or do you say, you know, I contracted a disease yesterday. I need to go cure it. Let's fight in a month. Uh, do you go get stronger? Do you hire assassins to kill them? Do you get a poison to weaken them? Like, there's just so many options depending on your character. Now, as for the GM, um, that's a different story. And and again, that boils down to whether are you the kind of GM that tries to create even matches for your players? Or are you the kind of GM that has a setting where there are different power levels of enemies that you could potentially be facing and you know what happens happens i think i think uh you know my general pro- so number one the game is designed to be lethal now that said it, it's lethal but it's lethal in a kind of forgiving way in that the death and maiming table does allow for survival even if there's consequences for surviving um you know death isn't the only thing that's on the table here but it is a lethal game, and you kind of have to be prepared. If if if, if you're, this is my attitude at least. If you're if you're going to go in that cocky and and take on foes that you know you, you don't necessarily know if you can beat them or not, uh, you have to be prepared for the possibility that you could die in a, a duel like that. Otherwise, there really isn't any tension in the game if that's not a possibility. That said, that there are there are things you can do to mitigate it beforehand by you know doing reconnaissance or you know investigating your foe in some way or trying to observe them and and you know that that was one of the reasons why the talking and analysis phase exists but uh i i do feel that you have to kind of be prepared for the possibility that your character might die um you know unless of course you know the gm is playing uh in a in a in a less lethal style then things might be different but you know i I don't know how to how do you feel about that well, this makes me think of, um, and I'm going to get into a spoiler here of a novel, the novel, I, f- I can't remember how it played out in the movie version, but in the novel of Heroes Shed No Tears, if you haven't read it, I suggest you read it and I suggest you skip the next maybe 30 seconds because I'm going to get into spoilers from it. But basically the ver- the ending of the novel, the very climactic fight scene, essentially is this exact situation where, now again, spoilers here come major spoilers, the the villain of the novel, the antagonist, who is basically uh, this awesome antagonist who thinks of everything and has everything planned. He has this plan that's working out perfectly, but there's one thing he doesn't know. And that's essentially that, if you wanted to put it in terms of our game, it's almost like uh, the guy that he's trying to kill has the perfect counter to his weapon. It's like, And he doesn't know it. And then yeah. in, and he goes in for the attack, and then and one minute he's about to win everything, next minute he's dead. So that's a genre trope that I think is perfectly fine. And if you're a so from the GM perspective, um, now this is getting into GM style, which I think we're going to talk about more in a second. Um, I personally, uh, I mean, it depends on the players, but I I don't I'm not the kind of GM who relishes player death. I don't like the players to die or want them to necessarily. I mean, if I can help it, and by I say help it, it's like I don't want to put them in a no-win situation, but if they're going to throw themselves into a situation where they're 100% sure that they're going to win and the enemy happens to have a counter, I mean, that's how Usha goes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're going to get, get killed, and it falls in line with the genre, and uh, that's basically how we design the game. Yeah. yeah, and just on the subject of character death, one one thing that I'll say is, I you know, I, I've been playing since 86 and i went through all the different phases and all the different trends that occurred in in the hobby up until this point and at a certain point i think in the early 2000s there was a convention that emerged which uh which we all kind of embraced which was 
you don't kill the player characters unless they do something monumentally stupid. They're sort of player characters accrued this plot immunity that, you know, it wasn't in every campaign and in every table, but most tables you started to encounter this and it became sort of the advice that was given in all of the big uh, magazines like Dragon and all of the, you know, like, on the you know, when Wizards of the Coast took over, it was sort of, you know, uh, it became the advice that was present in a lot of the books and what I found was I was not enjoying the game as much. And so I went back to the older material and I realized one of the things I liked about the very like early stages of me playing this hobby was you didn't know if, you know, the, the dice were just going to kill your character randomly. You just didn't know there was that, that game element to it. And so once I started embracing that again, I found I was having more fun. And so that's kind of where I come at the whole lethality character death thing. That said, I do think you had mentioned relishing player death. I think that GMs who relish killing players, that's the wrong way to go. I think that what a GM who is engaging lethality in a campaign needs to be doing is they just need to be willing to kill characters, not trying to. I think that's that's the difference. Um, if you're going out of your way to kill player characters, th that's sort of more punitive and it's, it's not fair. I think that you want to, um, when, if death is on the table, you need to be as fair about the game as possible because then you're, uh, you know, if, if players don't have that kind of immunity, uh, you know, they need to know that the, that the rules are being, uh, implemented fairly and across the board. Do you know what I mean? I think that's important. So, um, uh, so yeah, so, but again, the, the game, even though it is a lethal game, it you know we we do provide guidelines in the book for managing, uh, you know, power levels and you know, uh, and and one way that Jeremy talks about in the book is um, uh, managing it on the fly by you know okay you you can you know if the and and this was more from the GM side of the player characters are overpowered and how do you manage that? Well, you introduce more powerful foes. But the other side of that is the the Zhang Hu should respond like a real world to the characters, anyways, and so there, it makes sense that like, and this is something you see in Wuxia campaigns. I mean, not Wuxia, Wuxia movies and Wuxia books. If some big threat emerges in the Zhang Hu, some like some player character or some NPC who is super powerful, then the world itself should naturally respond to that. So if it's on the if it's on the player side where the power is coming from, you would expect to see sex starting to form alliances against those players. If it's on the other end of the spectrum where the players themselves are facing overpowering foes, the players should be encouraged to form alliances with other... You know, they, That's something that you have to start uh, thinking in terms of, is encouraging your players to form alliances with more powerful characters. And one way to do that is when players seek out more powerful allies, have those allies respond in a positive way. Don't have them just shoo the players away. I think that's something that GMs might reflexively do. You need to be open-minded when your players are running up against a brick wall and they're seeking uh, uh, alternative ways to contend with a more powerful foe. I don't know if that gets into to anything that you were thinking, but... Um, well, I was just going to, I actually was going to rewind a bit and add a, one other thing to the player death thing, which is, um, you know, I, I've played in groups where I've, you know, experienced player death, both of my own and other players. I think a lot of it for me personally is going to have to do with the pl people I'm playing with. Yeah. And I think a lot of my impression is that more experienced people who have been playing for a number of years and have, have experienced our player, their characters, dying did i say player death anyway player character death um, <laughs> player death is a different thing uh player character death um i think it you know if they're experienced and have have had that happen and they're fine with it then that's a different story yeah. but if it's like i've played with a lot of new people and it's like you, it's their first you know campaign and they're super excited they've spent a week making this character and it's like the perfect character i'm going to be a lot more hesitant to let that, that character die in the first couple uh, sessions, and not that I'm gonna, you know, if they do something, they jump off a cliff, I'm not gonna save them, but I'm gonna be much more hesitant to d kill their baby on the first time around, as opposed to the experienced um, people out there. And the other thing I was gonna say is this makes me think of 
And this comes down again to GM, you know, uh, philosophy. But there's a YouTube channel uh, by a guy named Seth Skorkowski, and he does a lot of reviews. I mean, I've gone back to watch this section of the video a couple times just because it's funny, where he's talking about player death, and specifically he's talking about um, whether GMs should fudge die, die rolls. Mm. And his basic, if, to sum up his his theory, is is that he thinks that um, basically I think GMs shouldn't, but occasionally there's a situation where it might make sense, and he has a, a, a little section of the video in which a player dies. And he the end result of both ways of doing it is that the player dies, but but by tweaking it a little, he you can make that death a lot more exciting and fun, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, you know, character walks in, up, oh, you're dead, and then you're like, well, dang, that sucks. As opposed to making it part of something exciting and fun. Um, anyway, I, I recommend that video. It's, I know it's kind of not going to be easy to track down just by me mentioning it, but I think in my my philosophy, and I, I don't want to get too sidetracked because I know we're going to talk about yeah. uh, GM philosophy in a little bit, but. My philosophy is that I want the players to be having fun. So if they're having fun and they're, and that involves their players, uh, their characters dying and they're having fun and everything, then that you know let it roll. Yeah. If everybody's going home like depressed, <laughs> then maybe that's not the best way to to run it. Uh, yeah, you just got to balance it depending well, on your style. So uh, the other thing I should say is the table is what matters more than anything else. Like we can have these internet discussions and these online conversations. Yeah, but. Um, it's one thing for me to say this is how I run a game, and this is, and then for, uh, but if I say to you, you should run it that way too. The problem is you go back to your group and you try to do something that I'm telling you, and it doesn't work because you're, somebody starts crying because one of their characters dies. So I don't know, you know, whatever you're running into. Um, I've I've always believed that uh, the, the what works at the table is what matters most, and 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 you shouldn't like rigidly enforce some kind of gaming philosophy onto your table. That said, I think you should be transparent with your players. So one thing I do is I say to my players, if it's a, if the game is going to be lethal, I say, look, character death is on the table. Make a backup character. You could die at any time. And and the way that I make that clear to people is I do a dice fall where they may style of approach. I never use a GM screen. Now, granted, I'm playing online these days mostly, so it's you know it's more honor system than anything. But I never use a GM screen, and I. Uh, and, and, and if a character dies in the first session, in the first five minutes, that happens. One benefit of that happening is players immediately know, yes, this is a high lethal campaign. Um, that is going to depend on who you have at the table. For the most part, I haven't had any issues. I, I, I think maybe part of it is the people I game with. Another part of it might be my personality. I'm not, my delivery when people die, I think is, 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 uh, is gentle. Do you know what I mean? So I, I feel like uh, it's usually accepted. I haven't had like somebody storm away from the table in a rage. <laughs> I had I had one player many years ago, kind of storm out of the room, not like at it when it happened, but kind of left the game angry. Um, but that was that was a uh, 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 a game where the players were actively trying to kill each other. It was uh, it was a mm. crime campaign. And I think that there was some miscommunication there. But that's the only time that I can really remember in recent memory where something like that has occurred. But it can certainly happen. So you, you want to... Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, people are more important than the game. So you got to figure out for yourself how to, how to deal with that. Plus, um, another factor is, I think, uh, the, the player's level of responsibility in it is a factor as well. If the players dying because of choices they made and, you know, they understood the risks, then that's, I think, 100% acceptable almost no matter what. But when you kill a player because of things that are at least to some extent or even completely out of their control, that kind of sucks. And it's like it, it, ta it takes the, you know, a lot of the fun out of it. So, you know, you got to consider are they are you players walking just walking down the road and then all of a sudden they get ambushed and and then killed and you're and that's going to have a different impact than if they're trying to sneak into the castle that they know is full of traps and bad guys and then one of them ends up dying two different things yeah and to be clear i fall in the camp where i feel like the am like and this is as a player more than as a gm i'm fine with the the ambush death um i remember i uh bill ran a uh a first edition uh campaign a while back and i played a mage and in like, I think the 
first or second session i got killed by a sturge it was it was it, it might have even been the very first combat i can't remember but i remember thinking oh this is awesome i got killed by a sturge like i enjoyed it um so people come to these games for different reasons is i guess what i'm getting at some people they want their deaths to be meaningful for a player like me a meaningless death actually adds meaning to the game, if that makes sense. Because it's sort of like, yeah, this is a game and we're playing into that. So you kind of have to know the players and you have to know, uh, you know... Uh, I guess what I would say is there are a lot of different GMing philosophies around character death. And what people shouldn't do is they shouldn't just mindlessly apply one of them yeah. to their group. They should really think about who's at the table and what it is they want. And... And, and and think about why they're there and why, you know, is it adding to the fun or is it taking away from the fun? In my case, plot immunity was taking away from the fun, so I moved away mm. from it. But for some people, it might not. Maybe they want death off the table. Now, now, one way that you can have a game like this remain gritty and, and not, uh, but if you want death to not be a hindrance to the characters remaining in the story... You could, you could still use, say, the death and maiming table, but just take death off the table, and you still have all of these other things that could happen to them, that have consequences for combat going awry for them, but they still can be active in the game. So there are solutions to that issue. Um, yeah, one there was a. Um, I'm sorry if this person is listening because I can't remember your name off the top of my head, and actually, uh, this person left a. I would say, I don't think it was a a, a blog post. It was just on Twitter. Uh, they played the game, really liked it, and gave some feedback. Uh, and some of the the feedback was basically it was really good. And this person mentioned our podcast as well and said that they really liked it. So I suspect that uh, you might hear this. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry again for forgetting your name. Uh, but one of the things that was mentioned was that they thought it was too lethal. And that was okay. one of the things they didn't like about it. And now I personally think number one is basically if you, you know, you should come into it expecting that lethality. But I do think that go ahead and tweak the rules a little bit, like yeah. you mentioned, or, or, you know what you could do, take, uh, you know, lift death saving throws from, uh, Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition, either straight, yeah. just lift them out of there or adapt it where you like. You know, if you roll death on a table, give your players a chance to beat it or yeah. something along those lines. Like they yeah. get to they get three rolls and if they fail two, then they actually die Can, or something to, to, to there, mitigate that. Um, there is there is actually a really good solution to this. Um, one, one thing. Well, we're going to get into this anyway. So so uh, I'm, I'm doing a series of one shots with Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades and I'm doing a lot of experimental adventure structures and things like that. And one of the things I wanted to do and the reason why I mentioned Golden Swallow and challenged anybody to run Golden Swallow is I originally was like, hey, guys, let's do a, a session of Golden Swallow. Let's let's have everybody play a character and see if they can make that character using the Righteous Blood Ruthless Blade system. And then we'll just play the movie. We'll see what happens. You know, we'll start in like one of the key scenes of the film and then just see where things go. And somehow that led me to taking the game Hill Folk, which uses the drama system. And... And cludging that to Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, and starting a series of short campaigns that are sort of more dramatically focused. And the reason I'm bringing this up is Hill Folk's solution to character death is if a character dies, uh, everybody can kind of vote and and say that, like, like, basically a character doesn't die unless everybody pretty much agrees. And I'm kind of... I'm I'm not the the most expert person on drama system, so I'm probably kind of getting this wrong. But in, 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 unless everybody agrees that the death was dramatically appropriate or you know fitting for the story, the death doesn't happen. So in Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, you know instead of you know if a character dies, it's not really that big a deal to have them wake in the next day just you know seriously wounded or something. Do you know what I mean? And again, the death and maiming table is a perfect thing to to throw on there if you want there to be some kind of consequence for a near death. But, uh, but you could do something where you just allow the players to kind of say, no, we don't think that death is fitting. So the death doesn't actually happen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in tweaking games to your liking. So if the game is too lethal, like Jeremy was saying, 
go ahead and tweak that. It's not, it's, I'm not going to lose sleep over people playing the game differently than it's written in the book. Like I, 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 I've noticed a trend uh, in maybe the past 10 years where people are really into running the games by the rules. And they, I, I grew up in an era where we just, we all played the games differently and ran them differently and we tweaked the rules to our liking. And maybe I take that for granted and I don't realize that people can just go, you know. And so definitely change the rules if you don't like them. If you don't like you know, the way character advancement rules work in the game, tweak them. If you don't like lethality rules in the game, tweak them. You can, you can either adjust them so that they're the lethal level that you like, or you can totally jettison uh, aspects of them and, you know, uh, take death off the table. It's up to you. Um, you know, again, it kind of gets into why you're, you know, what, what your uh, reasons for running the game are in the first place. Um but yeah, I don't know. Did, 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 did you have anything you wanted to say there? Or was uh... I think that covers most of it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so the uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I think that I think that covers everything we had on the schedule for today. Was there anything else that we were going to get into that uh, that didn't come up? I I don't. Well, wanna... we mentioned a lot of it uh, in different sections, but we never really officially kind of got into our. I mean, we we did talk about it a lot but just to get into the gm side we we as we have touched on over the course of the last almost hour obviously you and i have different approaches and philosophies yeah. and stuff well, and we've talked about that a lot in the podcast as well but i don't think we we've ever well you kind of did get into how you approach it and but i didn't really specifically say how i um, like to approach it and basically i think one of the differences is i do like to at least try to plot out the story that I want to tell mm -hmm. and maybe that comes because I have a background primarily in translating but it's it's like writing as well yeah. in terms of story storytelling and so a lot of times I come to it with the the idea of wanting to tell a story mm -hmm. and so I tend to want to plan it out more now that's yeah. not to say that I railroad the players into following my story because I've had that happen to me and I hate that but I do like to sit down and plan a bunch of stuff out um you know I'll, I'll have the inn and i'll know who's in the inn and i'll know how many rooms it has and what are in the rooms and i'll know like you know all the different the names of the people in town and you know a little bit about their personality and you know i i know kind of generally where i want the players to go and i will hope to guide them in that direction if it doesn't work then then that's fine i'm, I'm happy to um adjust i think most recently i was i was running Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, and I've mentioned before that I wanted to do a um, Fate of Lee Khan, or basically like Dragon Gate in kind okay. of thing. And man, I planned, I can't, I tell you, I had everything planned out. I, because in the movie, whether it's Fate of Lee Khan or whether it's Dragon Gate in, there's a lot of these things where people show up at the inn and then another yeah. group shows up and like, yeah. who are these people? Well, I had like every single um group at every single table i knew who they were what they were talking about i had different groups for over a course of three days i knew exactly who was going to show up and who they were and what they were going to be talking about of course basically my players did everything different than i expected and i didn't use any of that and well, i just kind of like changed can... my, my my plan but the point was i did i do like to go in with a kind of more complicated plan and this this also falls in line with there's a um if you look if you look online for videos um and instructional stuff about writing uh there are a lot there's a lot of talk about people use different words like there's a uh, plotter and pantser in terms of writing or there's like george rr R. martin uses architect and gardener uh, there's different words but basically the point is when it comes to writing a story like for a novel not i'm not talking about role-playing games but there are some people who they just like to get in there and these are the pantsers. They like they fly by the seat of their pants, basically. Yeah. Kind of go in and they just see what happens and they roll with it. Yeah. And then the 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 plotters kind of sit down and they like plan everything out. Okay. And of course, when you're writing a novel, that's different than when you're running a game. But I think the general principle is similar, where yeah. some GMs like to see what happens uh, as things develop and play off of it, and then some like to plan out ahead. I think both of us kind of go between both. Like neither you're not like sandbox, and I'm like uh you know railroad um but i think we both have little different elements um but coming at it from the 
the beginning at least, I like to have a little bit more complicated of a foundation. Yeah, of course, we have differences in terms of how we handle things like the player deaths or like a lot of different things. But I think that's one fundamental difference. Yeah, I like to kind of let the players just do what they want. And then that way, I like it, it does depend. Like, And sometimes I'll start a campaign out with a little bit of focus just to kind of get things going. But it, it, it really depends on the campaign. But my favorite campaigns are where players just kind of, you know, take it upon themselves to go do something. And then that leads to places like, you know. Especially if they're smashing scenery. For me, that's fun because they, it, it sort of makes a more explosive campaign, I find. Um, yeah. But uh, but I will say this about the end thing. I think the reason why that tends not to work, with, and I don't know how you did it, so I don't know uh, if this is what was going on in your case. But I think the reason why that tends not to work is in those scenarios, in those movies, you have these different forces entering the inn, right? But they're all they're all grounded in some goal that's related to the inn. Do you know what I mean? There's something like, like in the fatal Lee Khan, you have the rebels, right? Who want to assassinate Lee Khan. You have Lee Khan who doesn't want to be assassinated, right? Like, so you have, you have this, this immediate, it, it's going, to, this chemistry is going to lead somewhere. And I feel like, um, if I were to try to run the fatal Lee Khan, the way I might do it is a one shot. And I might say, look, you guys are a group of rebels at this inn. Do what you want at the end, and then Lee Khan. You know what I mean? Like that. That would probably be the way that I would try to do it because it's really difficult to have that kind of adventure just arise naturally in a game. Um, but I don't know well, when you ran it. What What would you say were the successful elements, and what would you say were the unsuccessful elements? Well, the thing is that I did go into it with basically that sort of mindset, uh -huh. which was. I had, like, the, the people just weren't randomly in the inn. Um, there were people that were related to the plot. And okay, okay. I envisioned the characters kind of going into the inn, um, meeting there, getting a route. Like, so th the setup was they were supposed to show up a couple of days early mm -hmm. ahead of the group that they were waiting for. Like, they're, they're waiting there to intercept somebody. Okay. And they know who they're waiting to intercept, and they know that they're coming on this day, and they're supposed to come early. So my setup was they're going to go there early. They're going to get their, you know, get their room and kind of wait and then overhear conversations, make inquiries, maybe sneak mm -hmm. around as these time as the time ticks by. And then I was going to have that group actually come early so that they didn't have as much time to plan as they thought they did. And then I had a typhoon hit. Okay. Uh, so that they were stuck inside the building. Okay. Basically okay. where it all went wrong was they got there three days early and they're like, you know what, we're going to go to a different inn and we're going to go ask around the city yeah. and we're going to like set up this thing. Oh, and I, was like, I get you. I so get basically, you. if I had set it up where they were, because I set it in a city, yeah. if I had set it up where like you're three days out into the desert or by the border yeah. and you have nowhere to go, then I think it would have worked a lot better. I just, I, I, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to tell them, okay, we're going to recreate the fate of Lee Khan, so you guys need yeah. to stay in the inn. I basically yeah. let them do it, and I and I, I had strongly worded it like, hey, I hope you guys show up at the inn, and mm. but it, they did what they wanted to. So it all turned it turned out fine, and I was able to take a lot of the elements of that I had the, set up, and it was fun, I think. Uh, but my original intent basically was completely missed. So I think what I might do is since I made all, did all those preparations already and I have everything, timetables and everything, next time I set up a group, um, I might try to do it again and then do the setting out in a place where they can't, you know, gallivant in the city for three days ahead of time and set yeah. up all these preparations. And that might probably turn out a little bit different. I mean, in adventures are notoriously difficult for that reason. Cause yeah. the party can always just kind of get up. And, well, we're just going to go somewhere. Uh, that's I, the way that I run campaigns. Like we, I don't know if we've talked about this much in the podcast, but I, I used to do a lot of martial arts, and that you know, and 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 and, and, and they they were all styles that involved either competition or sparring and things like that. And one of them was Muay Thai. And in Muay Thai, when you um, when you and this will be relevant, you'll see how this is relevant in a moment. Um, when you get in something called the clinch, uh. Sometimes you're in the clinch with a more powerful opponent and they are trying to sort of uh, uh, force you into a position and it's actually better to just kind of go with it. 
sometimes. Do you know I mean the same with a punch? Like sometimes somebody hits you, it's better to go with the punch. With when you're playing a, a when you're running a game as a GM, I find, uh, and maybe this is what you did. I don't I don't know what your response to the party was. When the party goes in a direction you're not expecting, rather than push against it to just go with it, is usually the uh, the easier thing to do, and it's it's less exhausting for you as the GM because you're not like okay, I gotta fit this round peg in the square hole now. Um, but it is an act of letting go. So I find that, uh, um, I don't know, that's, that's how I would approach that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I did. And I, it, the thing is, like I said, it turned out to be really fun. It led to a really great, at least again, I didn't run a poll of the players and we were playing online. So I, and we don't really know each other personally. So I didn't have a chance to like hang out afterwards and get their opinion, but basically it led to a really hilarious scene where they, the the two players split. I was only playing mm. with two guys, so that made it a little bit easier. They split apart, and then one of them ended up following the other, thinking he was one of the bad guys they were looking for, and then knocking him out. It led to all kinds of hijinks and fun yeah. stuff that was great. I wanted, Another thing I wanted to mention was um, for quite a long time, I ran a, a Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Um, and this was when I was in China. And we, we were all playing in person at my house, um, and I was really into crafting at the time. And so I, and I had a spare time because of my schedule. And so I really was like, I was creating set pieces, essentially, you know, uh, cutting foam, painting, all that stuff, you know, buying, tr uh, you know, like model trees and all that different stuff. And so I would create set pieces where I wanted, where we needed to have a fight essentially take place at this set piece. And so that played into it a lot as well. Um, and the guys that I, were, I was playing with were not the kind you're talking about. And I think that has a lot to do with it as well. What I mean is they were not coming at it from the, you know, like, we want to uh, make this world our own. They were yeah, kind of coming yeah. over as like, let's have some beers and like, what's going to happen today? And so I okay. would kind of lead them along. And it wasn't railroady. Like, they, they often did things I was They expected expecting. you to have a clear adventure for that session, basically. If, if, basically, yeah. yeah. And, and we didn't start out, like, I, it was a, a journey along the way. We started out with no set pieces. I just mm -hmm. had a battle mat and, like, my my son's Legos or something. And then I, I ordered some miniatures and I painted them. And then I was like, yeah, this is pretty cool. I want to, now I want kind of want to make a, you know, this scene. And I did yeah. that. So it evolved into something where every couple weeks I would have a different set piece. Mm. And the result was, was me guiding them along the ways and guiding them along the way, not railroading them, them sometimes choosing different directions, but ultimately heading to sort of like linchpin events yep. that would be played out on the table. And for anybody out there who has, not done crafting and stuff like that um what i can tell you is that there's a for the gm who does it i think there's a big thrill when you say um okay and then you you're like give me a second and then you go off to the side and pull out this actual like castle and stuff mm -hmm. and the player's like whoa this is awesome and then you have a fight with little miniatures obviously if you're playing online you can't really do that mm -hmm. um but i do think that some of it some of my um desire to have a more like plot structure that that i'm in control of comes from that well also if you would run the the um the fatal econ adventure with that group it sounds like they would have bought into the premise immediately and it would have it would have remained at the end like you had yeah. anticipated so yeah. i think um uh i think it, it does it does both like you know i i you know I, i've been in a lot of different groups and there was a group that i used to run games for I don't know, 15 years ago, they wouldn't have been interested in a sandbox campaign. I wouldn't have been able to sell them on that. If I was, if I was still playing or running games for this group, uh, which I would be happy to do because they were all great players. Um, you know, I would probably be running something closer to adventure paths and I would have to, I, you know, so as a GM, I think something you have to learn to do is it's, it's good to have a style, like to say, I like sandbox or I like mysteries or I like dungeon crawls or I like adventure paths, but you also need to, try other structures and get used to them because sometimes what happens is you go from having one group that does one thing to a group that does another thing and those are the only players that you have at that time and it's like well now i don't know how to do this this particular structure there's actually um somebody who's particularly good 
at dealing with um, adventure structures is uh, the Alexandrian. I would recommend. Uh, sometimes he gets really deep. He gets probably a lot deeper into them than I would. So like uh, I'm very, you've probably noticed I'm very hand wavy and shoot from the hip. So I, I, I don't necessarily go to the level of granularity that he goes to, but but I would recommend checking out his blog because he has a lot of entries that are like, okay, here's a particular type of adventure design. Here's the structure to it. And here's how you can apply it. And, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty handy for, for those kind of things. Um, yeah, I think, I think with, um, uh, with that in too, I, I noticed that you mentioned that you had the typhoon and that's kind of what happened in, um, flying swords of dragon gate in, right. They had us, I think they had like a sandstorm and it kind of locked everybody. So, yeah. you know, a simple change of venue, like you were saying, could have also made it, uh, you know, the more... thing with the typhoon, the thing with the typhoon, I still had that happen, mm -hmm. but the problem was that because they hadn't spent the time, they had basically, they were basically treating the inn as a dangerous place. They didn't want to go unless they had to kind okay. of thing. And so because of that, they hadn't uncovered any of the clues and they didn't know what was really going on. So okay. by chance, well, okay, I'd have to admit, no, I, I, I actually ran it according to my original time ta timetable. I heavily foreshadowed the storm coming. Like I had them, I had them walking around and it's dropping rain and then the rain's getting harder and then it's starting to get windy and stuff like that. They did end up going to the inn and get stuck there during the typhoon and have to get rooms. And I didn't force them to do that. They made that decision. Yeah. But because they hadn't uncovered all these clues, they kind of didn't really get the full experience. And it was still fun. They ended up, you know, one of them ended up going out into the typhoon to try to climb up the side of the building and was like flying around in the wind when okay. using ropes to try to climb up. And then led to a, a, a chase across the rooftops, which we talked about in the last podcast, yeah. I think, about rooftops. It led to this rooftop chase during the typhoon with them kind of almost being blown off the roof and stuff. Yeah, not not quite the same impact. Another thing I just wanted to throw in, I mentioned the the blog post I have about the top ten uh, Wuxia movies, in my opinion, that can be converted into one shots. I have them basically split up into uh, my suggestion for either a linear storyline or a sandbox uh, style, and I think about half and half are are sandbox, half are sandbox, half are linear. So if you're looking for inspiration, check it out. There are some that I think could really make some amazing sandbox um actually like sandbox one shots in the sense that you don't really know what's going to happen in the end you kind of set the players up in a scenario and then it'll play out one way or the other yeah um, yeah i call those I situational those... adventures like like web yeah. of death right like somebody yeah, got exactly. the spider and now we have to see what happens and uh yeah that's it... one of them that's on the list because okay. it's like you could have your players be any number of the different factions and you could throw in different plot twists from the movie or whatever. Others are more, um, you know, one thing after another. Uh, so it, whatever your style is, I think you could find something on that list or, you know, just pick what from whatever movies are your favorites. And so, yeah. So, and, uh, and like I said, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing this weird thing where I'm clutching the drama system to righteous blood with this blades. And the drama system is actually, it's, it's very dramatic focused. It's all about scenes and it's about, um, characters and their relationships you make a map of the characters and their desires and their dramatic pulls and their their fraught relationships with other characters and in any given scene a character is supposed to be petitioning something from another character that they want and there should be some reason why this other character isn't giving that to them and so um so uh so we're using the drama system for the dramatic scenes but i'm using the righteous blood ruthless blade system to handle what characters can do and handle things like combat. And we, we, what we did was we, we created a sect, uh, last session. I think we called it, it was bullet shrimp sect. I think it's ba their, their technique is based on bullet shrimp. And I let them come up with the backstory to the, to, cause drama system is more about players kind of involving themselves in the creation of the adventure and things like that. And so, uh, they, um, uh, they came up with the they, they had this guy named Master Bo who was like a fisherman and I think like his family or his fleet of fishermen got slaughtered by pirates and he ended up on a on some kind of deserted island where you observed the bullet shrimp and he realized that the bullet the bullet shrimp do this thing where they they close their claw so quickly it creates like a blast of energy almost that would um uh, that goes through the water and uh, and so they he he modeled 
uh, they used them as a model to create uh, a martial art that would counter the pirates. And then he went on to become an, a master in his own right and form a, uh, um, a sect of wandering fishermen who uh, uh, eventually got so powerful that he was about to make some big announcement about the sect. And then he got poisoned the night of the announcement and the sect divided kind of like beggar sect into um, members who wanted to remain nomadic and members who wanted to kind of settle and become more respectable members of society. And so this is where the, the, uh, uh, the story is going to start. And we, you know, so we haven't actually started the session though, that we just did the backstory, but, um, but it's interesting because we, we already had a session where we tried to, to clutch the drama system to righteous blood, ruthless blades, and it worked okay, but, uh, they weren't all part of the same sect and that seemed to be a problem. So this time I made them all part of the same sect and, uh, and yeah, so so uh, so you know, I'll, I'll report Sounds periodically fun. on on how that goes, um, but and that's way outside my wheelhouse because I don't normally run games that way. That's a very different style of GMing for me. Um, yeah, so I guess we can we can head out unless there's anything else we need to to talk about. Um, yeah, so again, we should say Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades is available. You can go pick it up at Amazon. You can get it at Drive Through RPG. It really helps if you like the game to give a written review of it or to mention it online somewhere. That word of mouth is becoming very important. Um, you know, if, if, if there, there's a there, there's just so much stuff out there, it's sometimes hard to break through. So any amount of uh, of word of mouth is 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 definitely helpful. And uh, we'll be back on. Uh, we'll probably do another movie discussion. I know we want to do The Wandering Swordsman at one point, so we'll probably get to that. Uh, and uh, until next time, we'll talk to you later. With the laughter comes the rain. With my anger comes a tide of emotion. Killing joy, cutting steel. Dead or insane